Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Him to send salutations and blessing, blessings on the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and His family and folk and companions and all those that follow Him until the last hour. <coughs> Inshallah, we'll start with the Fatiha for uh, all of the Muslims that are suffering, all the Muslims that have been martyred, and uh, most recently in our part of the world, the the victims of the Chapel Hill shooting. So inshallah we'll do Fatiha for them and all the Muslims. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Tayyib, so uh, continuing, continuing our discussion, inshallah, uh, of the text Qurat al-Absar, we left off we concluded the section on the uh, the mawali and the and the khuddam, so the clients and the servants, freed free servants, freed servants and free servants of the best of creation, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we we concluded with uh, Uqba ibn Amir, line 193, as well as Saad dhu Mikhmar, Asma and Hind, and we uh, quickly discussed who they were. Uqba ibn Amr, we wanted to uh, relate one hadith that he relates. Allah be pleased with him. And so this is, uh, this is related by both Bukhari and Muslim and Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah, he put it in his Riyadh al-Salihin. Uh, and he says, uh, no, he says that uh, عن أبي مسعود عقبة بن عامر الأنصاري رضي الله تعالى عنه that he said لما نزلت آية الصدقة كنا نحامل على ظهورنا when the verse of uh, charity was revealed we were carrying on our backs the uh, what we would donate we we literally put property on our backs to give uh, to respond to that to that ayah فَجَاءَ رَجُلٌ فَتَصَدَّقَ بِشَيْءٍ كَثِيرٍ so one man came and donated a tremendous amount this was Abdurrahman ibn Auf he donated uh, half his wealth when that ayah was revealed فَقَالُوا مُرَائِن so the hypocrite said he's just showing off he's just showing off وَجَاءَ رَجُلٌ آخر فَتَصَدَّقَ بِسَعَ <clears throat> and another man came, and he merely gave a very small portion. فَقَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌ عَنْ سَائِ هَذَا And so the hypocrite said, Allah does, has no need for such a trivial amount of, of charity. فَنَزَلَتْ And so the verse was, re- was revealed, Surah Tawbah, verse 79, was revealed in response to their mocking. Which is الَّذِينَ يَلْمِزُونَ الْمُطَّوِّعِينَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي الصَّدَقَاتِ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ إِلَّا جُهْدَهُمْ فَيَسْخَرُونَ مِنْهُمْ سَخِرَ اللَّهُ مِنْهُمْ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Those people who uh, find fault, who find fault in, in المُطَّوِّعِين The مُطَّوِّعِين are those that do, do above and beyond. They engage in نَوَافِلْ Supererogatory works. They f- so those people, the hypocrites, who find fault with the mutawwa'een amongst the believers, fis sadaqat, with respect to their charities, as well as those that they do not find except their mere their very efforts. They do not find except their very efforts, i.e. the first group, mutawwa'een, those that give a whole lot, they're giving above and beyond what's required. And then the second group, like people that just gave a little amount, <coughs> one saw, la yajiduna illa juhdahum, they don't find except their efforts. There's not much actual wealth. Allah says, فَيَسْخَرُونَ minhum." So they mock them. The hypocrites were mocking them. سَخِيرَ اللَّهُ minhum. Allah will mock those hypocrites. وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ And they'll have a tremendous, uh, a painful torment. And so there's a tremendous lesson in this about what's called غِبَةُ qalb. غِبَةُ qalb or غِبَةُ lisan. What they were engaging in is backbiting of the tongue. So they saw people doing good and they assumed the worst 
and say, oh, he's just showing off. This one is giving something trivial. They, they use their tongues and they, they were sinful for that. And they're mocking, there's, uh, you know, for their, for their uh, you know, mockery is, one of the, is, a, is, a, is a profound example of metaphysical consequences to physical actions. So using the tongue to make fun of someone, the metaphysical consequence, Allah mocks that person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mocks that person and then there's a punishment uh, but this also applies uh, to ghibatul qalb which Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah says is haram just as ghibatul lisan and so our thoughts How, what sort of thoughts do we have when we see uh, people doing good what sort of thoughts do we have because the nafs tends to assume the worst oh he's not genuine he's not sincere He's this and that, she's that and the other, and you know, he's doing it for this ul- ulterior motive. And all of these, uh, it's there's a there's actually a speech in the mind, all of these thoughts percolating, which is assuming the worst. And this is called su adhan. Ghibatul qalb is a synonym for su adhan, which is having a bad opinion of others. And so it's a type of backbiting and it's a type of mockery, and it's very serious. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed about these hypocrites that because of their mockery, Allah will mock them. And so if we have a bad opinion of each other, then Allah will have a bad verdict for us. He doesn't have opinions, but he'll have a bad verdict. So what's the, what's the, way, what's the approach of the believer is to think best of people. Someone is trying to do something good. MashaAllah, may Allah accept it. MashaAllah, you know, may Allah give him tawfiq. And one of the secrets of husnadhan, the opposite, is to think well of others, is that even if the person has a bad state when they're doing the, the deed, the power of a fellow believer's good opinion might transform his state. This is one of the secrets of Husnadlan, that when we think well of each other, even if the other is not doing it for the right reasons, because I think well of him, he will actually end up doing it for the right reasons. That what we project onto the other, Allah will respond as a, as a, because of the barakah, because of the blessing of thinking well of each other. Simply because of that barakah, Allah will actually transform that person to doing the good. And so you can't lose. Like the nafs and shaitan will say, trust me, he's not doing it for the right reasons. Just look at him and you'll find all these indications that he's not doing it for the right reasons. Well, even if that's the case, have a good opinion because it will actually have an effect. It will actually have an effect. And this is something that we are in desperate need of, inshallah. Bismillah. So Imam Nawawi, he says that whoever can't come up with 70 excuses for his brother, he has little tawfiq. He has little tawfiq. And, uh, you know, Alhamdulillah. So, uh, wanted to share that hadith by Uqba ibn Amr. The next section is the Hurras, the chapter concerning the bodyguards of the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bayanu Hurras in Nabi al Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi rabbuna wa sharrafa. To clarify, who were the bodyguards of the chosen Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Benedictions and our Lord's honor upon him. We say, حَرَسَهُ فِي يَوْمِ بَدْرٍ سَعْدُ فَتَى مُعَاذٍ وَمْرَآنِ بَعْدُ نعم فِي أُحُدٍ مُحَمَّدٌ ذَكْوَانُ عَلَيْهِمُ الرَّحْمَةُ وَرِدْوَانُ So these first two lines, 195-196 On the day of Badr, his bodyguard was Sa'ad, the son of Mu'adh. After Badr, they included two at Uhud. They were Muhammad ibn Maslama and Thakwan. Upon both of them, mercy and divine grace. So at Badr, it was Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, he's Sayyid al Aus. He is the leader of Aus, which is one of the two tribes of Yathrib, Aus, and Khazraj. Uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is the one that uh, his Islam, it's an amazing story of his conversion. So after the first Aqaba, when uh, the Prophet وسلم, sent Mus'ab ibn Umair to Yathrib to teach the new Muslims, the small group of Muslim uh, of Yathribites that had become Muslim, 
Sayyidina Musab went and he taught them Quran, he taught them how to pray, he led them in the prayer. And he was staying at the home of As'ad ibn Zurara. As'ad ibn Zurara, who is the cousin of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. As'ad ibn Zurara was the cousin of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was not yet Muslim. So uh, he, he, uh, uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was very frustrated and uh, upset at this shift in their, in their society, in their small community in Yathrib. And so he wants to rid Yathrib of this quickly. Just, you know, it was a, it was a nuisance or annoying thing for him. So he sends uh, Usaid ibn Hudayr, Usaid ibn Hudayr to go and uh, he was of his clan. He said to go and, and basically scare him away. So Usaid ibn Hudayr takes his lance, his spear, walks up to Sayyidina Musab and basically threatens him. He's holding a weapon. He says, you know, basically leave or else. Uh, in his own words. And Sayyidina Mus'ab, he uh, maintains his composure and he does not get aggressive with him. And he simply says in a, in a very calm state, why don't you just sit and listen to what I have to say? And if you like it, you can accept it. If not, then fine. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be hostile. And so Usayd ibn Hudayr sits down, Sayyidina Mus'ab recites Quran to him. It, it, it enters his heart and he becomes, becomes Muslim. So then he goes back to Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh and Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is like, what did you just do? And he says, he says, you know, and, uh, you know, I just sat down with him. And so he says, he says, I, I'll have to do this on my own. He didn't want to do it on his own because it's his cousin that's hosting him. So he didn't want to cause a f friction in the family. Asad uh, ibn Zurara was hosting him. So he, take, he takes the lance himself, goes up to him very angry and makes a similar threat. And Sayyidina Mus'ab makes a similar similar uh, offer to sit and listen. And when Sayyidina Mu'adh sits and listens, he becomes Muslim. And because he's the Sayyid al Aus, he's the leader of Aus, he simply, he calls all of Aus and he makes an announcement and he says that whoever is with me in his own, the way he said it, the, the meaning of which whoever is with me, then let him believe in Allah and the Messenger وسلم, And all of Aus becomes Muslim. His entire tribe becomes Muslim. So really, in an, an overnight phenomenon, it was at the hands of Sayyidina Mus'ab through Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And so he has a tremendous, tremendous merit. Uh, and he's also the brother of Iyas ibn Mu'adh. And if you recall from the Sira, Iyas ibn Mu'adh, uh, before Aqaba, before the Prophet ﷺ made a, a, his, you know, the, the, the da'wah that led to Aqaba earlier on in the Sira. Uh, a, a group of Aus and Khazraj went to Mecca to help resolve some of their tensions that they were having uh, in Yathrib. And uh, when they, this was early, early in the Sira, and they, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, you know, introduced himself, and they basically weren't interested because they came for a political reason, and so they weren't interested. But this young boy, Iyas, he urges them, you should take this message ser seriously. And the elder amongst them basically disregards him and is very rude to him. And they say Iyas died shortly thereafter in, in Yathrib and he was making dhikr the whole time. He was praising Allah the whole time. And so Iyas ibn Mu'adh is considered the first uh, Yathribite to become Muslim. So that's the younger brother of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh at whose hands all of Aus became Muslim. And so then Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, he has the honor of standing outside the tent of the Prophet Wasallam at Badr. So the Prophet Sallallahu at Badr, he established a tent, he, they made a tent for him, and he was inside there making dua the entire night. And the only one with him inside the tent was Sayyidina Abu Bakr. He's the only one that was with him. That's his maqam, he's the sahib of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even in the words of the Qur'an, إِذْ يَقُولُ لِي صَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ When the Messenger said to his companion, i.e. at the Hijrah, do not be grieved. So Abu Bakr is always with the Prophet ﷺ first, and at these at these most salient, you know, these these immense moments of the Sira. So Badr, Hijra, these are key key events. Abu Bakr is with the Prophet ﷺ. So Abu Bakr is inside the tent, supporting the Prophet ﷺ, making Amin to his du'a, saying Amin to his du'a, and the last protection in case anyone were to enter the tent, Abu Bakr is there to protect the Prophet ﷺ. But who is outside the tent? Saad ibn Mu'adh. 
and he's up the whole night outside the tent guarding him. So he's the had, Haris, he's the bodyguard of the Prophet Sallallahu And the whole night, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi makes dua. The entire night, the Prophet Sallallahu is standing before his Lord, pleading to Allah to give them victory, saying that if we do not win, all of Islam will be lost. You will not be worshipped anymore on earth. And Abu Bakr is saying, Ameen. And it's so much so that the cloak of the Prophet is falling off and Abu Bakr is keeping it on. And it's to the extent that Abu Bakr himself says, it's enough, Ya Rasulullah. It's enough, like your Lord has, has heard your plea. And what's really uh, telling about this moment is that the Prophet ﷺ was already guaranteed victory. The Prophet ﷺ was already guaranteed victory at Badr. And so the question is why then? Why such, why even A, why dua, but B, why with such intensity and pleading and, you know, just pouring uh, of, of the heart? And our, our teachers mentioned that the reason is that the, the essence of dua, the, at the, the core, the lub, you know, really the kernel of supplication is manifesting one's servanthood. It's manifesting one's servanthood. Idhar al ubudiyah. This is this is at the core. This is not to negate that we make du'a so that seeking the blessings of Allah. We seek Allah's fadl. We seek His bounty. We ask Him to receive because we seek from Him. Subhanahu wa taala. We seek the good from Him. And the Prophet said, the best thing you can ask for after certainty is afia. The best thing you can ask for after being certain in Allah is well-being, health, safety, security. Al-Afiyah is, is, encompasses all of these facets. And in fact, one narration says the best thing to ask for after Yaqeen is Al-Mu'afa. Al-Mu'afa from the same root, but they, the ulama say that it's even more encompassing than afia. Al-Mu'afa is, is the ultimate universal uh, 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 you know, well-being and, and, and safety and security and health and all of these facets. So we, we seek those good, that good. رَبَّنَا أَتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا Good in this life, good in the next life. But at the, at the essence of dua is manifesting our servanthood, just expressing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our need for Him. أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُطَّرْ إِذَا دَعَا Isn't He the one that responds to the desperate one when the desperate one calls on Him? Really it's to show our desperation, our state of of utter need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is what the Prophet was doing وسلم. He's, his cloak is falling off he's begging his Lord in the tent the whole night although he's guaranteed the answer it's already been given he's been promised victory and uh, and uh, that this is also one of the secrets that the dua we make after Adhan is to ask Allah for the shafa'ah the Prophet ﷺ instructed us after every adhan, ask Allah that Allah resurrect the Prophet ﷺ with the wasila and fadila and darajat rafi'ah, the lofty station and the means, the wasila, the way to God and this and the fadila and then mubathul al maqam al mahmud and resurrect him on the praiseworthy station. He's guaranteed the praiseworthy station. In fact, it's a point of our aqidah. And in our aqidah books, we affirm the shafa'a. It's something that the Mu'tazidis and others desired, Ahlul Sunnah, we affirm the Shafa'a. So it's a point of Aqidah. But why do we ask? Why do we beg Allah for it? Because we're manifesting our slavehood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're manifesting our slavehood to Allah. And this is why Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he's being thrown in the fire, he doesn't ask Allah. He doesn't actually. So he, he turns away from the asbab, from the means, even the metaphys the spiritual means of Gabriel. And he turns away even from asking, and he just says, God is sufficient for me. God, Hasbunallah, God is, is our sufficiency. This is tremendous. So the, the prophets, السلام, the prophet at Badr, السلام, Ibrahim heading toward the fire, السلام, they're teaching us the kernel of supplication. The, the, throughout the days and the nights, they make dua. They teach us to make dua for specifics, but at these great moments, they're teaching us the essence of du'a, which is just showing your, your need for God, showing, if, uh, uh, reflecting your need for God, expressing your need for God. So that's uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, tremendous companion. And he died shortly after the Khandaq. 
He was wounded at the Khandaq and he, sh he died shortly thereafter. Allah be pleased with him. Then at Uhud, line 196, it was Muhammad ibn Maslama and Dhakwan in the Mawahib al Luduniya of Qastalani. He says that it was in fact only Muhammad ibn Maslama who was the bodyguard at Uhud. And Dhakwan was the bodyguard at Wadi al Qura. At Wadi al Qura. So it's a slight. Uh, discrepancy from the text then one line 197 Waqas Mushfiqi so at the at the, at Khandaq the battle of the trench or the ditch the bodyguard was Az-Zubair ibn al-Awam the cousin of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam through his aunt his paternal aunt Safiya whose husband was Al-Awam ibn Khuwaylid, the brother of Khadija. So Sayyidina Zubair is both cousin to the Prophet from on his mother's side, and he is nephew of Khadija on his father's side. Nephew of Khadija on his father's side. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every Prophet has a Hawari, every Prophet has a disciple. And my Hawari is a Zubair, and my disciple is Zubair. My disciple is Zubair like the Hawariyun of Sayyidina Isa Islam, the disciples of Jesus. So the disciple of our Prophet is Sayyidina Zubair, and he has the honor of being the bodyguard of the Prophet at the Battle of the Trench. And then, as well as Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Okay, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, and he says, Khayru Mushfiqi, the best of those who feared God. The best of those who feared God. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas is also a cousin of the Prophet on his uh, mother's side through Amina because he's from Bani Zuhra, the same clan of Quraysh as Amina bin Wahab. And uh, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas is one of the 10 promised paradise, as is Az Zubair. Okay, so they're both amongst the Ashar al Mubashirin bil Jannah who were promised in one hadith, and we'll discuss that inshallah next week. And uh, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, he was one of the first converts to Islam early, early in Mecca. And he became Muslim at the age of 17. And he, uh, his mother uh, was so upset at his, at his Islam that she vowed to never eat again until he reneged on it, until he left Islam. And he pleaded with his mother, and he brought her food and drink every day, pleading with her to just eat and take care of herself and that she's only going to hurt herself. But she refused and refused until finally she saw that his conviction was unwavering, and so then she broke her vows, started eating again, and it's with, it, it is with respect to him that Allah Ta'ala ta revealed the verse that uh, if your two parents strive to take you out of Islam, then do not obey them. But, but still keep good company with them, but still get, keep good company with them. And so he is tremendous. Uh, and also, Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, uh, there's an important hadith about him, uh, also in the uh, Riyad al-Salihin. Because he got very ill at the farewell pilgrimage. The year of the farewell pilgrimage, he got very ill. Although it was not his death sickness, but he thought it was his death sickness. And so, in this hadith, that uh, it's in Bukhari and Muslim as well. An Abi Ishaq, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, Malik ibn Uhayb, ibn, ibn Abdi Manaf, ibn Zuhra, ibn Kilab, ibn Murra, ibn Kaab, ibn Lu'ay, al Qurashi, al Zuhri, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This is Sa Sayyidina Sa'ad. Ahad al Asharit al Mashhud, lahum bil Jannah, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, qal. That's how Imam Nawawi begins the hadith. He says, Ja'ani Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ya'uduni a'ma hajjat al Wida' al Wida' he says that the messenger, God's messenger came to me to visit me during an, a, an intense illness that I had the year of the farewell pilgrimage that was overbearing for me. I said, O oh God's messenger, you see the intensity of the pain that I am in. And I have tremendous wealth. 
ولا يرث ولا يرثني إلا ابنة لي أفأتصدق بثلث مالي He says, I have a lot of wealth, and I only have one heir, which is a daughter of mine. So should I give two-thirds of my wealth in charity? قَالَ لَا The Prophet said, no, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. قُلْتُ فَشَطْرُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Half then, O God's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَقَالَ لَا قُلْتُ فَثُلُثُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Okay, a third, O God's Messenger. قَالْ أَثُلُثْ وَثُلُثْ كَثِيرُ O قَالْ كَبِيرُ He says, a third, and still a third is a lot. Or in one, or the Rawi is not sure. He either said a lot or uh, much. Kathir or kabir. Inna ka antadara warathatak agniya'a khairun min antadarahum alatan yatakaffafun al-nas. For you to leave your heirs uh, wealthy and self-sufficient is better than for you to leave them indigent, uh, seeking charity from people. وَإِنَّكَ لَن تُنْفِقَ نَفَقَةً تَبْتَغِي بِهَا وَجْهَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا أُجِرْتَ عَلَيْهَا حَتَّى مَا تَجْعَلُ فِي فِي إِمْرَتِكَ I mean these, you know, the Prophet ﷺ had جوامع الكلم So in just a few words, few phrases, he's giving uh, tremendous, tremendous meanings. He says that, and that were you to uh, give any charity that you give, seeking thereby the countenance of, of God, uh, you will not do it except that you're rewarded for it to the extent of what you, the morsel that you give to your family, the morsel of food by which you feed your family, i.e. to take care of your dependents, is a tremendous charity. And, you, and when, you, when you take care of your dependents, you do so seeking Allah Himself. You do so seeking Allah Himself. He says, تَبْتَغِي بِهَا وَجْهَ Allah," And the waj, according to the Arabs, is the, that, the God Himself and nothing besides. And so, this is the basis of, of uh, that the that the uh, what's it called the bequest, the wasiya, the wasiya in a will, you cannot get, leave more than a third for charity. Okay, this is the basis. This hadith is the basis that you cannot uh, take out more than a third of your uh, of your estate for charity, uh, and that's the max. And even that, the Prophet said, it's a lot. It's a lot, i.e. give your sadaqah to your dependents so you don't leave behind people that have to ask others for help. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the major, one of the main sunnahs and a, and a, a great sunnah that he taught is to be, just to stand on, on one's own feet and to not ask for others. And remember last class we said one of his conditions of bay'ah that he gave to Abu Dhar al-Ghifari was that he cannot ask anyone for anything even if he's sitting on his a horse and he drops a whip on the floor to ask someone to pick it up. Even that he was forbidden to do, Sayyidina Abu Dhar. He had to get down and pick it up himself. And so take so to leave let leave one's dependence doing that. And there's a miracle in this hadith because Sayyidina Sa'ad says, Ya Rasulullah Ukhallafu Ba'd Ashabi, will I remain after my my friends? And the Prophet says, إِنَّكَ لَن تُخَلَّفْ فَتَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا تَبْتَغِي بِهِ وَجْهَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا زَدَتَّ بِهِ دَرَجَةً وَرِفْعًا وَلَعَلَّكَ أَن تُخَلَّفَ حَتَّى يَنْتَفِعَ بِكَ أَقْوَامٌ وَيُدَرَّ بِكَ آخَرُونَ He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Verily, you, would, you, will not be, you will not remain after your friends and do any, a single deed seeking thereby God's countenance except that you will elevate thereby in degree and rank. And Haply, perhaps, O Sa'ad, you shall, be, you shall live longer until many peoples benefit by you and others are harmed by you. And this is a foretelling, because he does live beyond. He does not die at that time. And he is under, the, under Sayyidina Uthman and under Sayyidina Umar and Uthman. He's placed as governor of Kufa. And it's at his hands, Sayyidina Sa'ad's hands, that Persia is opened. It says at his hands that Persia is opened. And so many, many peoples benefited by Sayyidina Sa'ad and others were harmed, those that, that were uh, against, against him. So this was a for, prophetic foretelling. And uh, in, in, the, in the expedition to Persia, uh, Sayyidina Sa'ad was uh, with, uh, with the army and uh, they came across a big river and there were 30,000 of them. 
And they said, what do we do? How do we cross the river? And so Salman al-Faris, he was there and he made dua and he said, let's ride on. And the, all 30,000 rode onto the river and crossed the river on the water. It is one of the miracles of Sa'd ibn Waqas and Salman al-Farisi. And uh, they crossed it on top of the water. And so then the hadith continues, Allahumma amdi li ashabi hijratuhum. Oh Allah, fulfill the hijrah of my companions. Wala taruddahum ala aqabihim, And do not leave them on their heels. Lakin al-ba'isu Sa'd ibn Khawla. And then the Prophet uh, gives a bit, he's, he feels bad about this other companion who he had made hijrah, but he came back uh, to Mecca before and before the fat, and so then he lost the reward. So he says, the poor soul, Sa'ad bin Khawla, because so he made dua that, the, that Allah complete the hijrah of his, of his companions. No. So then 198, ثُمَّ أَبُوْ أَيُّوبَ وَابْنُ بِشْرٍ فِي خَيْبَرَ الْمَشْهُورِ دُونَ نُكْرٍ دُونَ, دون نُكْرِ And then at Khaybar, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, as well as Bishr, uh, Urbad ibn Bishr al-Awsi. Urbad ibn Bishr al-Awsi. No. They were the bodyguards at uh, Khaybar. So Abu, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, he is the one that hosts the Prophet وسلم, immediately after the Hijrah. And he was a very clever, intelligent person. So the way he did that, he just grabbed the luggage and brought it in his house. And so the Prophet وسلم, stayed with him. Naam. And, uh, Naam. and at, at, this is at, Naam. at Khaybar, they were the bodyguards. And then he says, line 199, uh, And then later at Wadi Al-Qura, it was Bilal ibn Rabah, without a doubt. And, uh, but the commentator says that at Wadi Al-Qura, it was also the Kwan. It was also the Kwan. وَتَرَكَ الْحُرَّاسَ لَمَّا أُخْبِرَ بِعِسْمَةِ اللَّهِ لَهُ خَيْرُ الْوَرَى And then he concludes the list of bodyguards. He says, The best of creation later abandoned bodyguards after being informed that he was under God's direct protection. Okay, so when the ayah was revealed, وَاللَّهُ يَعْسِمُكَ مِنَ النَّاسِ When the ayah was revealed, وَاللَّهُ يَعْسِمُكَ مِنَ النَّاسِ And God shall protect you from people. Then, uh, according to Tirmidhi's narration, uh, this is when the Prophet ﷺ stopped keeping any bodyguards. And uh, Tirmidhi relates that when the ayah was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ literally uh, placed his blessed head out of the, 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 the room that he was in and told the people, Ya ayyuhan nas in sarifu faqad asamani Allah. And whoever was there at the time, he literally told them, he, st- he placed his blessed, blessed head وسلم, out of the, the, the tent or room, and he said, oh, people, go away, for verily God has protected me. And this is deemed sahih by Hakim, this narration, and the Habi concurs. Uh, there's two tafsirs of this ayah. One is that... Um, is specifically from assassination. It's specifically, it's particular to Allah will protect from assassination. The other tafsir is that after uh, after Uhud, uh, this was revealed as general from any uh, painful blow, from any painful blow. So it's either general for being wounded any type of wound or specific to uh, assassination itself. No. And then he uh, he has one more li- uh, two more lines in this section. He says, وَكَانَ حَادِيًا لَهُ الْبَرَاءُ أَنْ جَشَتٌ جَاءَتْ بِذَا الْأَنْبَاءُ جَاءَتْ بِذَا الْأَنْبَاءُ صَلَّى عَلَيْهِ رَبُّنَا وَسَلَّمَا وَالْآلِ وَالْأَصْحَابِ خَيْرِ مَنْ سَمَا So he ends with the... Uh, 
the Hudat, singular is Hadi. Uh, the Hadi is the singing camelier. The Hadi is the singing camelier. And so when the Prophet would travel and it was on the camel, this is the tr custom of the Arabs, there would be a person who would, uh, who would sing poetry and it would move the camels. It would move the camels and the camels liked it. And they had different meters for different aims for the camels. So these are singing cameliers. And the, the text mentions two, two uh, Al Bara ibn Azib as well as Anjasha. Al Bara ibn Azib and An Anjasha. Al Bara, uh, excuse me, Al Bara ibn Malik. Al Bara ibn Malik. Uh, Al Bara ibn Malik was the paternal brother of Sayyidina Anas. So if you recall, we said Sayyidina Anas, was bo he, his mother, Umm Sulaim, was originally married to Malik ibn Anadr. Malik ibn Anadr, who did not become Muslim. He went to Sham, the Levant, and he died there without becoming Muslim. And that's when Umm Sulaim remarried uh, later in Medina. And she married uh, Abu Talha, I believe his name was, right? So, uh, and if you recall, the, there's a hadith about at Uhud, after the news spread that the Prophet ﷺ had been killed, there was a rumor on the battlefield after the injury, because the one, the Qurayshi that did it, he ran back and said, I've killed Muhammad, and so the rumor spread. A lot of Sahaba were disheartened, and they stopped fighting, and they, 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 they were overwhelmed by, by grief, and uh, and and... Uh, there was one companion, Anas ibn Nadr, Anas ibn Nadr, who who went ahead and kept on fighting, and he had so many wounds, and the the Sahaba just stopped and, and looked at him. That's the brother of Malik ibn Nadr, and so the uncle of Sayyidina Anas, and Al Bara. So Al Bara is the half brother uh, of Anas, or full or full brother. They're not sure, and he was at all the. Uh, expeditions, ex battles, except for Badr. Now, the Prophet said about him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, This is in Tirmidhi. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi how many a, an unkept, disheveled person who has but two ragged, raggedy garments, two coarse garments, and no one cares about him socially. No, he's given no consideration. Were he to make an oath by Allah, Allah would certainly vindicate it. Would like without delay. Were he to say by Allah, I want this, it would happen immediately. Okay? And we saw, like, like we said, Sayyidina Salman, when they had to cross the river, he made dua, they were able to cross it. Uh, Khalid ibn Walid once he saw a man drinking alcohol he made dua and it turned into honey this is related by ibn Hajar and others there's many examples of companions they, they just would make dua and it would happen so the Prophet وسلم, he indicates he says how many how many a disheveled unkept person who who is socially unimportant uh, were he to make an oath by Allah, Allah would vindicate. And then in this narration, minhum al Bara ibn Azib, uh, al Malik. Amongst them is al Bara ibn Malik. He's one of them. So this is the Prophet ﷺ is completely turning on its head the 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 misconceptions of jahiliyyah, the idea that someone of poverty or a low class is unimportant, is insignificant. In fact, they are the most significant. This is really from the prophetic teaching. The people who are socially low who we would not consider, in one narration that if they came to your door, you would ask them to leave. Madfu'an bil abwab. If they would knock on your door, you'd say, please, not here. Uh, these people are the secret of blessing in our community. And the secret of blessing in any society. The, a society has blessings poured upon it because of the disenfranchised amongst them. This is one of the rules of Islam. This is one proof, this hadith. There's many hadith. First of all, their spiritual rank. The Prophet said the, the fuqara will enter paradise 500 years before the aghniya. The, the, the poor and indigent will enter paradise 500 years before 
the wealthy. He said, uh, Help me find the weak amongst you. Help me find the weak amongst you. Because the only reason you are given victory, the only reason as the community does well, and the only reason you have food on the table every day, nasr and rizq, is because of the disenfranchised poor amongst you. And i.e. if it weren't for those people, no one would be eating and the community would not have any success. This is a hadith, sahih hadith. And there's a secret in the wording. He says, The most commentators say, help me find. Because the Prophet says, he didn't, he needed people, you know, some poor people, they don't, they don't, the, the, the ones that have the most dignity, they don't want to show, they don't want to ask for help. So the Prophet was telling the companions, if you know someone that is so dignified in his poverty, he's not even going to ask for help. Bring him to me. Bring him to me. Ubruni. But there's an ishara in this hadith. Because literally it means, seek me through the poor. Ubruni. Like, seek me out by means of the poor. I.e., when we help the, the poor, when we help those of, quote-unquote, low social standing, i.e. terrestrially low but celestially high, when we seek them, we are, when, we ha- when we go through them, who do we arrive at is the Prophet ﷺ. Because ana wa kafir yatim kahakada. He says, me and the one that takes care of orphans are like this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so what it, and that's why he was given a choice to be a king prophet and a, and a materially poor prophet. They said, we, the angel came, we can turn these uh, mountains to gold and you'll be like Suleiman Alayhi Salaam. And, he, and then Jibreel Alayhi Salaam, Ashara ila tawadur. Gabriel gave, indicated humility. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, I choose to be a materially poor prophet. And so he lived the life of a poor person. He said, Allahumma ahyini miskinan wa amitni miskinan wa ahshuruni fi zumratil masakin. Like he says, oh Allah, this is his dua, oh Allah, let me live as, as materially poor and let me die as materially poor. And then what does he say? Wahshurni fi zumratil masakin. And let me be resurrected in the company of the poor. Now, the, the goal of every Muslim is to be resurrected in his company because he is higher, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he places himself lower and the masakin are higher. Let me be with them. Give me that honor. Wahshurni fi zumratil masakin in the akhirah. Lo aqsama ala Allah, because if they just say, by God, I want this, it happens. And Sulaiman alayhi salam, who was materially the richest, materially the richest ever, he had the jinns and the winds and the whole thing, all this wealth. He, every day, Imam Ghazali in his Ihya al has a narration, every day he would leave his house and all the upper class wealthy people would have like halaqas, like they'd be seated. And they'd say, come sit with us, come sit with us. He'd pass them, pass them. Come sit with us, come sit with us. Pass them, pass them. All the way to the end where all the poor people were. And he would just sit in their midst. And he would say, miskin ma'al masakin. Is what he would say. A poor person amongst the, amongst the poor people. A poor person amongst the poor people. And that's why we, we read last week in the hadith, the Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, when he said that he said my, my Khalil, my my closest beloved friend, enjoined upon me the following, and we listed the the shurut, the conditions of of his bayat to the Prophet The first two were what, amarini bi hubbil masakin wa dunui minhum. He the first two conditions in that hadith, the Prophet commanded Abu Dhar to love the poor and to intermingle with them to literally be physically close to them. Because people, unfortunately, f- part of jahiliyyah is that, yeah, I'll help them, but from far away, I don't actually want to keep company. You know? And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, he was so angry at walimas, wedding feasts, that the, only the rich were invited and the poor weren't allowed in. Sallallahu You know, like, yeah, we're, we're, we're kind enough to help, but we don't actually want to keep company with them. And so he commanded Abu Dhar, Love them, so it starts in the heart, to actually have mahabba for the poor, to actually love the poor people. 
and to be close, physical proximity, to share their space, to literally share their space. And this is like, you know, we cannot under emphasize enough how great a sunnah this is. And this is, and whoever revives a sunnah has the reward to yom al qiyamah, reviving. So we should we should really emphasize this. And unfortunately, you know, it's really sad that how many indigent Muslims will go to masajid or different centers and they're not finding what they need. It's just a reality. They're not finding what they need. So it behooves us to take these ahadith seriously and to uh, and to really empower. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tremendous good in store for those who are disenfranchised. He has tremendous good good in store. When we do an namuna ala ladina stood aifu fil ard, when I jalum a immatan, when I jalum al wari thin. Allah says in the Quran that we, we intend on granting our great favor upon those that were made weak in the earth. And 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 we intend on making them imams. And we intend on making them heirs. Warithin. And just look what Allah will do to the disenfranchised in this country. I'm going to rise. It's the sunnah of Allah. And this is uh, one of the masters. Imam Qushayri relates in his, in his epistle, Risale Qushayriya, in the Bab al-Faqr. It's actually a chapter in our spiritual manuals, Bab al-Faqr, the chapter on poverty. And there's, there's, the, there's, the, there's, the, there's the material poverty because... The early, you know, like the Sufis, they weren't too interested in the dunya. So they lived, most of them were materially poor. Although there's wealthy ones as well, because even prophets are wealthy. Wealth is not inherently evil. It's not inherently evil. But there's also spiritual poverty, having faqr for Allah, you know. And, and so, and poverty is of different types too. Even material poverty, it's not only wealth. So there's a hadith, for example, there's a hadith that says, a man, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, uh, I love you, Ya Rasulullah. And he says, be careful what you say. And he says, I love you. He says, be careful what you say. He says, because uh, poverty is quicker, faqr, faqr is quicker to the one who loves me than a flood at its peak is in reaching its end point. Okay, so when the flood is at its peak, look, imagine the speed, how quickly it reaches its end point. Faqr is quicker to the, the one who loves the Prophet Now, the, the, the commentators of this hadith, they don't limit it to uh, poverty of property, of, of wealth. They say it could be, faqr here means lack of any, anything valuable. So if a person, it could affect health. A sickness is a type of faqr because you're in need of health. Uh, loss of loved ones is a type of faqr because you're in need of that companionship. So what it means is musiba. Faqr in that hadith means musiba. The one that loves the Prophet ﷺ, musiba will hit them quicker. Uh, affliction, trial, calamity will strike them faster than a, a, a flood to its end point. But the, those that are disenfranchised, the poverty and indigent, of a society, uh, Imam Qushayri, in his Bab al-Faqr, he relates from one of the Imams, uh, Mu'ad al-Nasifi. Mu'ad al-Nasifi said that, إِنَّمَا مَا أَهْلَكَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى قَوْمًا وَإِنْ عَمِلُوا مَا عَمِلُوا حَتَّى أَهَانُوا الْفُقَرَاءُ وَأَذَلُّوهُمْ He says, Rahimullah, Allah never, this is a sunnah, a sunnah of God. What's the way God deals with his creation? The pattern of God's dealing with his creation. God, most high, never destroys a community. He never brings, a, brings about a downfall of a civilization. No matter how evil they are, no matter how much vice and sin they're engrossed in, the, the, the downfall won't happen until what? What's the turning, what's the breaking point? What's the point of no return when, 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 it's, when it's done for that civilization? Until they dis abase and disrespect the poor amongst them. 
when they mistreat and disrespect the disenfranchised, the poor amongst them, that's when, that's the sunnah of God, that's the way he brings about the downfall. And so to, to keep a civilization afloat, the means is to do ta'lim, is to venerate and love the, 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 the low people, the, the socially low, the disenfranchised, the, the afflicted people, the afflicted people of a society. Nam. And Anjasha, Anjasha is also, he's one of the uh, hadis, the one of the singing cameleers. And in, a, in Bukhari and Muslim, it's related that on one expedition, Al-Bara ibn Malik was singing for the men and Anjasha was singing for the women. And Anjasha, his singing was a bit intense. The, ty- the style of the poetry was a bit rough, getting the camels to get excited. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he says a famous hadith, Ruwaydaka rifqan bil qawarir. He says, uh, you know, take it easy, Anjasha. Take it easy, Anjasha. Uh, be gentle with these fragile glasses. Be gentle with these fragile glasses. Uh, glass vessels referring to the the women and so this is also a tremendous sunnah is uh, being gentle to women this is what manliness entails chivalry entails being uh, soft with the women folk so rifq rifq is another huge huge sunnah of the best of creation, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Rifq is the key to a happy household. Tenderness and gentleness is the key to a happy household. So the Prophet said, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There's many hadith of uh, rifq. إذا أراد الله تعالى بأهل بيت خيرا أدخل عليهم الرفق. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires for a family good, he places amongst them gentleness. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires for a household to have good, he places in their, amongst them gentleness. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Sahih Muslim, Inna rifq la yakunu fi shayin illa zana, wa la yunza'u min shayin illa shana. Rifq, tenderness and gentleness, is never placed in a thing except that it adorns it. It's never placed in a thing except that it adorns it. And it's never removed from, the, from a thing except it leaves it disfigured. Gentleness is never removed from something except that it leaves it disfigured. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna Allah yuhibbu rifq fil amri kulli in Bukhari. Allah loves gentleness in every single matter. مَنْ يُحْرَمَ الرِّفْقِ يُحْرَمَ الْخَيْرِ كُلُّهُ Whoever is barred from gentleness is barred from all good. And one time, uh, some of the people that were mocking Islam in Yathrib, they passed by, and instead of saying, As-salamu alaykum, peace be upon you, they said to the Prophet Wasallam, As-salamu alaykum. And as salam means death. Instead of salam, they changed it to salam. So our mother Aisha got excited and she said, Wa alaykum assam wa la'na. And upon you be death and as well as God's curse. And the Prophet says, Mahlan ya Aisha. Just take it easy, O Aisha. And he said this famous hadith that, Inna Allah rafiq yuhib al rifq. Allah Himself is gentle and tender. And He loves gentleness and tenderness. Wa yu'ti ala rifq ma la yu'ti ala al anaf. And Allah will give by way of our being soft and gentle, what he won't give by way of our being rough and coarse. And, and what he won't give by any other means. There are certain divine gifts through our composure and gentleness that there's no other way to get them. There's no other way to get them. And so whether it's with our families, whether it's with the uh, women folk, 
whether it's with the children, whether it's with those spitting vitriol at us, right? All of these hadith are indicating rifq. Be composed and soft and the tawfiq will come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give gifts that he otherwise uh, will not give. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, now the Rusul, the ambassadors of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bayan Rusul al Mustafa Liman Malak Sallallahu Alaihi Allahu Madar al Falak, line 203, to clarify who are the ambassadors of the Chosen One to the rulers of the known world. Prayers and peace of God upon him as long as heavenly orbs revolve in their orbits. We say, 204, <coughs> The Prophet sent to the Nijis of Ethiopia, Amr, and the Nijis honored the letter sent and read it aloud. He later died as a Muslim, and the Chosen One performed the funeral prayer with his pure and chaste companions over him. So the Nijis, the Najashi, he gave protection to the Muslims early when they migrated to Abyssinia. And he was a Muslim. And he, uh, even initially when he gave that protection to the emigrants in the early part of the Sira, some of his, uh, his council and his people, they were concerned that has he become Muslim, has he left the religion, of Christ. And so they all uh, gathered around him and called him out and demanded to know what he stood on. And so before he went out in that assembly, he wrote on a paper, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, and he put it in his coat pocket. So he comes out and, and uh, they say, you know, do you still believe in, the, they force him, they say, do you still believe in the religion of Christ? And so he says, I believe in this. Right, and so it, it, they understood it as that he still remained on their religion, but he, of course, had iman in his heart. But this is permissible in that context because it was in the situation for the Muslims. It was most prudent that he remain in power. And were he to proclaim his Islam, he would have been killed, lost power, and then the Muslims would have been driven back to Mecca or tortured there in Abyssinia. And so that's that was his ijtihad. Uh, so then later, when the Prophet ﷺ sent letters to the different rulers, he sends one to the Najashi. And the N Najashi, of course, uh, he bajala, you know, he honored the letter and he recited it. And uh, uh, he, the, it says that he actually, when the letter came in, he got off of his cushion out of adab, out of adab to uh, the letter that the Prophet wrote to him, ﷺ. And uh, his Islam was good. And so when the Prophet ﷺ was returning from Tabuk, Najashi dies. And the Prophet informed his companions on that very day uh, as, a, as, a, as a miracle. And he performed the Salatul, Salatul Ghaib, the absentee funeral prayer, which uh, the Shafi'is, based off of this hadith, they say it's legislated in the Sharia. So if, if a Muslim dies in another land, one can do the Salatul Ghaib uh, instead of the Janaza, which is in person. The Hanafis said that Salatul Ghaib is not mashru'a, it's not legislated for gen in, in general for Muslims. And as for the Hadith of Najashi, it's khas for him. It was, it was specific for him. Why? They say because the Prophet uh, Allah opened a vista and the body of Najashi was right there through the vista. And so the Hanafis say it was still Salatul Janaza in, in, per in person. It was an absentee. So that's why they don't say, they say that you can't do Salatul Ghaib. Um, the next ambassador, line 206. Wadihyatun uh, ila Hirakli. No. So the, excuse me, the ambassador to Najashi is Amr ibn Umayyah al Damri. Amr ibn Umayyah al Damri. Now, the, the second 
ودحية إلى هرقل أرسل فشح ثم ابن حذافة إلى كسرى. So دحية الكلبي دحية الكلبي دحية ابن خليفة الكلبي He is an eminent companion uh, and he was sent to uh, Heraclius Heraclius the re- leader of Byzantine but out of love of his kingdom Heraclius or Hercules refused to convert no so he does not become Muslim Dihya uh, al-Kalbi they say that he was so beautiful he was used as a mathal like as beautiful as Dihya the Arabs would have this phrase as a metaphor for how beautiful Dihya was he was such a handsome man and um, when Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam would come in the form of a man because our mother Aisha in Bukhari she asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how does the revelation come to you he says sometimes it comes like salsalatil jaras like the reverberation of a bell and that's heaviest for me and it's interesting because tilawa which was new to the Arabs they did not have tilawa before Quran Quran okay they recited poetry but not with the tajweed and the ghunna and the tilawa so this is indigenous unique to the Quranic uh, revelation that uh, there is a there is a reverberatory aspect of tilawa. There's a, there's a there is a um, a ringing type of sensation with tilawa, like a buzzing type of, and uh, and what's interesting that there's studies done now about energy fields, and even like in the in the the cellular makeup of the body and how everything reverberates, and that the more we are exposed to these reverberations is actually healthy at the cellular level so there's a lot of interesting things about uh you know so the tilawa of quran so the prophet in that hadith says that sometimes it comes like salsalat al jaras and that's heaviest for me and then sometimes jibril comes in the form of a man and speaks to me fawait ma yaqul and so then i have comprehended and retained what he says after he speaks to me without effort of memorizing the prophet has comprehended and retained what, what, what Jibreel said. So the question is, what did Jibreel Islam look like when he would come in the form of a man? Okay, what was his surah? What was the image? Because he came in the form of a man when he would come. And the ulama say he always came in the form of Dihya al-Kalbi. He always came in the surah, the image of this companion Dihya al-Kalbi. Now the question is why? And the... This is mentioned by Jasus, a masterful commentator on the Shema'il of Imam Tirmidhi. Jasus, he has it. That's his name, Imam Jasus. He has a commentary. Um, it has a lot of asrar, like allus- allusions and secrets in it. So this is one of his the asrar that he noted. He says that the secret in this is that the Arabs in Jahiliyyah before Islam, whenever they would send a, an ambassador to a king, Okay, whenever the Arabs before Islam sent an ambassador to a king, they would send Dihya al-Kalbi. Okay, this was the individual that they always sent to the muluk, to the kings of the world. That was Arab custom. And the Nabi, the Prophet Wasallam, is A'adhum al-Muluk. He's the greatest king on earth. Right? He's the greatest king in creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in fact, one of his many, many names, and he has several. Some ulama say he has a thousand and one of his many names is Al-Malik. And now, of course, that's a divine name first. Allah is Al-Malik. But just like Allah is Ar-Ra'uf and Ar-Rahim, but he names his Prophet Bil-Mu'minina Ra'ufun Rahim, the Prophet Sallallahu he's reflecting in contingent human way, human manner, the attributes of, of the divine, right? He's reflecting through his traits, mirroring, as it were, uh, the 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 divine attributes which are timeless and uh, and absolute and so and on earth he is the spiritual king sallallahu alaihi wasallam he is al malik in creation and so then jibril alayhi salam would come in the form of dihya al kalbi based on arab custom based on arab custom so dihya al kalbi is a, allah be pleased with him no. alhamdulillah and uh, and quickly uh, complete this section. 
He says that Thumma ibn Hudhafata ila Kisra and then he sent Ibn Hudhafa to Kosros, the leader of Persia. Famazzaq al Kitaba Muzika and he tore the letter up and thus rent asunder his own kingdom. So when Kisra tore the letter up, it was again a physical action with metaphysical consequences, is that he was in fact tearing his own rulership because he would then that it led to his downfall. وحاطبا إلى الموقوق إلى الموقوقسي ارتقى and then حاطب ابن أبي بلتعة حاطب ابن أبي بلتعة was sent to Mukawqis the Coptic ruler of Egypt Mukawqis the Coptic ruler of Egypt who through intelligence rose to meet the challenge of meeting the ruler of Egypt so ارتقى حاطب he basically went and they weren't letting him in uh, when he went with the letter to Mukawqis they weren't letting him into the palace so he got on a small boat and went around on the river behind the palace and he literally stood up and waved the flag, waved the letter at Muqawqis who saw him through the window and he said, who is this man? And so he got him interested, so he, had, he called him in. So he says, Hatib had intelligence, the way to get the letter in. فَقَارَبَ um, Islam حَتَّى أَهْدَى جَارِيَتَيْنِ دُلْدُلًا وَعَبْدًا so Muqawqis almost became Muslim. He was very close. He strongly considered it. Uh, but according to the stronger narration, it seems like he did not. Uh, however, he did send a tremendous gift to the Prophet ﷺ, which we mentioned before. He sent uh, uh, two uh, bondswomen, concubines, which are Maria and Sirin, the two sisters. Maria, of course, is the, uh, was with the Prophet ﷺ, and he has with her... Uh, uh, a say, a Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, who died at the age of two or three. And then Sirin was gifted to the poet Hassan ibn Thabit. So along with that gift uh, was Duldul, the uh, the animal, and then Abda, and then Mabur, who we mentioned, one of the uh, uh, the Coptic eunuch who uh, the Prophet uh, freed. ثُمَّ إِلَى مَنْ مَلَكَ عُمَانَ عَمْرًا فَأَسْلَمَ لَهُ وَدَانَ And then the Prophet ﷺ sent to the two rulers of Oman his messenger Amr. This is Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As. Uh, and those two rulers did become Muslim and submitted to the authority of the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, Amr ibn al-As, of course, is... He was against the Prophet ﷺ early on, but he, along with Khalid ibn al-Walid and Uthman ibn Talha, they all three became Muslim shortly before Fatih Makkah. Amr ibn al-As, Khalid ibn Walid, and Uthman ibn Talha all became Muslim shortly before the conquest of Makkah. And the Prophet ﷺ, according to one narration, when, he, when they came to Medina, he says that Makkah has thrown out the uh, best portions of its liver because right, they were like cream of the crop of of the Quraysh at the time. And, uh, and Amr ibn al-As was the one that was against the Muslims originally in Abyssinia. He was trying to argue the, to the Najashi to send the Muslims back. Uh, and so the, now he becomes Muslim and he, he, uh, he brings a letter to Oman. وَلِلْيَمَامَةِ سَلِيطًا أَرْسَلَ فَلَمْ يَفُوسْ صَاحِبُهَا إِذْ سَأَلَ مِنَ النَّبِيِّ جَعَلَ بَعْدِ الْأَمْرِ لَهُ ثُمَّ إِلَى الْبَلْقَى شُجَاعًا أَرْسَلَهُ وَأَرْسَلَ الْعَلَى إِلَى الْبَحْرِينِ فَأَسْلَمَ الْمُنْذِرُ دُونَ مَيْنِ وَالْعَشَرِيَّ وَمُعَاذًا الْيَمَنِ فَأَسْلَمُوا دُونَ قِتَالٍ وَفِتَنٍ He sent Salit. Okay, Salit is Ibn Amrin. Salit Ibn Amrin, who I believe is the brother of Suhail Ibn Amr. Al-Amiri, who was the chief of Bani Amr, the clan of Bani Amr of Quraysh. I believe it was his brother. He sent Salit uh, to Al-Yamama's ruler, Huda. Uh, but he did not obtain victory due to his request. And then uh, Huda, Huda with the soft ha. Due to his request that the Prophet grant a portion of the affair of prophecy or authority to him. So that, that wasn't going to fly too well. All right. So Huda, the ruler of Yamama, said, 
I'll do it as long as I get to be a co-prophet. And uh, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Then to Jordan's ruler, he, the Prophet Sassam, sent Shuja, which means the courageous one. That's Balqa. And, uh, and then he sent Al-Ala ibn al-Hadrami to Bahrain. And so Al-Mundhir, the ruler of Bahrain, did become Muslim. Al-Ala ibn al-Hadrami was sent to Bahrain and Al-Mundhir did become Muslim. And, uh, and then finally, he, Abu Musa al-Ashari and Mu'adh ibn Jabal were sent to the Yemen. And the entire country of Yemen became Muslim without any fighting or friction. Without any fighting or friction, all of Yemen, the Yemen became Muslim. Uh, you know, before Q&A, we'll just conclude. Al-Ala ibn al-Hadrami was really, really special, like all of the companions. Uh, he had a lot of karamat. He had a lot of saintly miracles. And so on the way to Bahrain, they came across, again, a body of water. And he made dua, and they all crossed the water without their feet getting wet. They walked on water without their feet getting wet. And, uh, and another time, he was leading an expedition in the middle of the, of the desert, and uh, their camels ran away, and there was no water. And he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it started raining right then. All this rain in the desert, it wasn't normal for it to rain there. And so he had a lot of karamat. And uh, finally, the two that were sent to Yemen are Mu'adh ibn Jabal and Abu Musa al-Ashari. And these were two eminent, eminent companions. Mu'adh ibn Jabal is the Imam of Halal and Haram. Okay, Sayyidina Umar said, if you have a question on the fiqh of lawful prohibited, ask Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And if you have a question on inheritance, ask Zayd ibn Thabit. And if you have a question on Quran, ask Ubay ibn Kaab. And if you have a question on wealth and finance, ask me. So Sayyidina Umar, Radha Ta'an Anhu. And Abu Musa al-Ashari, they were both sent. The Prophet ﷺ uh, gave them instructions, the two of them. He said, Yassira wa la tu'asira, bashira wa la tunafira. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, make it easy, make things easy for people. Don't make things difficult. Give glad tidings, do not drive people away. And this is a fitting point of departure for our class today is that really that's what Islam is meant to do. And when Islam is not doing that, then something is wrong with the one interpreting Islam in general. Islam, Allah says, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ هُوَ اجْتَبَاكُمُ مَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ That he, Allah did not place any undue hardship in this religion. Haraj. Allah did not place any undue hardship in this religion, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so... The, the religion is supposed to facilitate. And this is what the two ambassadors, Mu'adh and Abu Musa, were commanded to do, is that the way you, you, you interpret the, the teachings of Islam, it should facilitate for people, it should not make it difficult, and it should bring joy and good news to the believer, not depress them and drive them away. Okay, so there's, this is a bushra. This religion is a bushra. The Prophet is a bushra. It is a tremendous glad tidings. Obviously, there is effort we're not denying that the religion entails effort but that effort uh, it should be in balance and it should lead to fruits which outweigh the difficulties right this is the point and so a, a real teacher is someone who uh, when we listen to them our waswasa goes away and when we listen to them we feel positive about approaching Allah we are drawn to Allah by a, uh, where at, and this is what Sayyidina Mu'adh and Abu Musa al-Ashari, they were real teachers. And so all of Yemen becomes, right, because they facilitated, they brought joy to the hearts, and they showed the, the beauty of Islam, despite it, its, its rigors, it has rigors that one has to do. But, uh, you know, no matter, as long as a person is diligently attempting to draw near to Allah, then wherever they're at, whatever their pace, you know, that's fine that they're heading to Allah and, and uh, Allah's tawab al-Rahim. Abu Musa al-Ashri is the one who relates the hadith that, Allah, that, Allah, that the Prophet said, Verily Allah extends His hand in the day for those that sin at night and extends His hand in the night for those that sin at day. So even when we trip, Allah is there ready to receive. Allah is waiting for us. Where are you? Why aren't you with me? All right, why aren't you with me? So even in our low moments, Allah is even more merciful. Allah's mercy extends even more when we when we slip. 
And that's why Rumi, Molana, he says, come, come, this, wherever you are, whatever stage, ours is not a caravan of despair. And this is really at the essence of the prophetic way. So if there's any questions, inshallah, we'll endeavor. Um, I don't know the details of that. So that was uh, from Egypt, the Coptic Egypt before Islam. Uh, you know, that's obviously prohibited in Islam. Uh, castration is prohibited in Islam. But was that a common practice in Jahiliya? I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen any literature on it that the Arabs did it. That this was what that, that ruler sent. So Allahu Alam. Um, any other questions? So the hadith uh, is that Abuguni bid du'afa that help me find the poor and weak amongst you. Fa innama tunsaruna wa turzaquna bid du'afaikum because you are only granted victory and your and and provision because of the weak amongst you. So what what does the hadith mean? That we take the means, so you go get up in the morning, get dressed, go to work put in the, what used to be eight hours is now about 12 at least, I think, usually. Put in your time, come home exhausted, uh, and then you have, at the end of the month, you have a paycheck, and you go buy your groceries, and come home, prepare the food, cook the meal, bismillah, the meal is ready. The Prophet is saying, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, those are real means, but there's a, there's a hidden means. There's a veiled means that you don't see. It's because of the poor people amongst you. The reason why Allah facilitated that whole process such that you can have food on the table is because of the barakah, the blessing of the poor. That's what the hadith means. And the same thing with when the community is doing well, the nasr from Allah, victory from Allah, when the community does well in society, you take all the means that the, that the community can excel. Uh, but uh, again, the facilitation of all of that and the fruit of all of that is only because of the the poor amongst us. They, they are the source of barakah, of blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all doors are open, whether personally in terms of our sustenance or communally in terms of our success because of the, the disenfranchised. You know, it's their blessing. Yeah. Does that mean that we should have tried to eradicate poverty? Mm. No, quite the contrary. It doesn't mean we should not try to eradicate. It means that we should honor them and, and help them serve them, show gratitude to them by, by lifting them out of that state. But, uh, you know, the nature of the world is that there's going to be poor people, right? And there's going to be, even in Medina, uh, you had Ahl Sufa. So you had all these companions that are the most charitable and are giving so much, but there's still, Allah Ta'ala creates circumstances that despite the goodwill of, of, the, of, of the people with with material means, they're still going to be the indigent. So we work our best to help them, but realize that that the that the weak amongst us are the source of blessing. And it's not simply materially poverty, materially poor. So the sick people, the the, the you go to the cancer ward, all the people in the cancer ward, they're the reason why we're getting blessings. The people who were wrongfully wrongfully imprisoned, they're the reason we're getting blessings. All of the disenfranchised, afflicted people of society are the basis of, of, of our success. This is this is the meaning. No. Yes, Bismillah. Let's see here. There's a few questions from online. Let's see what we can take. Um, Ilham asks, was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam poor by choice? And then our good brother uh, Adrian Woodsmith asks, how much do our modern conceptions of Bahrain, Yemen, Jordan correspond to the kingdoms mentioned in the text? And then there are a couple others. Okay, the first question, uh, what was it again, sorry? Was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam poor by choice? Uh, so 
we want to qualify the poor was is materially poor, right? So because he said in a hadith, "Laysa al-ghina bi kathrat al-arad, inna al-ghina ghina nafs." He said he clarified what wealth is. He says, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, ghina richness is not by a lot of stuff. Richness is only by richness of soul, uh, satisfaction in the heart." Satisfaction in the heart, and so in that sense, he's the richest of creation, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because he's the most satisfied. Why? Because he's satisfied in his Lord, subhanahu wa taala. Uh, but materially poor, yes, he chose to be materially poor, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, like we said, that an angel came and said that if the Prophet wanted, he could turn mountains into gold for him, and uh, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam chose the way of tawadu, of humility. And that, uh, and so he chose the way to be a abd nabi rather than a uh, malik nabi. He chose to be a slave prophet rather than a king prophet. And it was also out of adab to his brother Suleiman, because Suleiman Islam asked to be given a kingdom that no one after him would have. There's also there's a hadith that there was a shaitan bothering some of the people praying in Medina in the Prophet's mosque. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I was about to grab it and put it on a, one of the pillars in the mosque and tie it up so that the kids could come beat it like a piñata, right? Just the kids could come, Ya Abunbi, just play and hit it. He says, then I, I remembered the dua of my brother Solomon who said, oh Allah, give me a kingdom that no one else will have. It's not suitable for anyone after after he Sayyidina Sulaiman Islam wanted to be the only one to have control of the jinn and the winds and whatnot. And so he's out of adab, out of respect to his, his brother Solomon's wishes, Adi Salam, he didn't grab the jinn. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he could have. He could have. So uh uh that he uh, he did not choose to be a king prophet also and then also because he is the universal mercy. Wama and so for you know all the people of this of the ummah that are are in tribulation all they can always find a sunnah or a they can relate to the prophet sallallahu through their tribulation and so this is something like you know loss of loved ones he he buried six of his seven kids how many parents have done that right sallallahu alaihi wasallam loss of a spouse he buried his beloved wife Khadija, after uh, you know, twenty-five some odd years of the best, most beloved marriage possible, the most mahabba, most love possible between spouses, he buried. He was orphaned. His his father died when he when his when his mother was two months pregnant. His 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 mother died when he was six years old. His grandfather died when he was eight years old. His uncle died. You know, so every every parental figure that he was connected to, he had to see them go. Yeah, and you look at every material poverty. He, he they, how many days he went without eating, without eating, without a fire being lit in his house. How much hunger? The the Sahaba said we're so hungry. They lifted their shirt. A stone is tied. He lifts his shirt and two stones are tied because the hunger, the pangs of hunger. When you tie a stone, it lessens it. Um, and and. And the, also, mystically, those stones have the barakah. They get the blessing of touching his blessed belly, which is real. That's a real, oh, oh brother, that's bid'ah to say that. Okay, if it's bid'ah, then why did Sawad, the companion, right before Badr, he, he, they, the sufuf, the lines were supposed to be straight. Sawad steps out of line, and the Prophet he, he has a little stick, and he pokes Sawad in the belly to put him back in line. He says, Ya Rasul, this is right before Badr. And the general tells a, you know, a, a member of the, of the, of the, you know, the, the, the group to step in line. It's a serious matter. He says, Ya Rasulullah, did you come with justice? Did you come with fairness? He says, of course. He says, so then can I do to you what you did to me? You poked me in the belly. Right? Any other general would be like, get down, give me 200 push-ups. He says, yeah, sure. He gives him the stick and lifts his shirt. And Sayyidina Sawad bends down and kisses the belly of the Prophet.
And the Prophet says, why did you do that, Sawad? He says, Ya Rasulullah, we see what you see. Death is imminent. I mean, it's 300 against 1,000. This is it. I wanted the last thing that I have in this dunya before I leave is that my skin touches your skin. That's, that's, all. that's the last thing I want. No, so those two stones had the barakah. That's the fiqh of a sahabi. It's not a bid'ah. But Allahumma salli alayhi wa sallam Muhammad. Uh, he has, so he, he chose to be. Yeah, so any tribulation, any tribulation that a person has, they can find consolation in the Prophet. This is part of his universal mercy. Whatever we're going through, we can find consolation in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's one of his miracles. No. What was the other question? Um, Brother Adrian asked, how much do our modern conceptions of Bahrain, Yemen, Jordan correspond to the kingdoms mentioned in the text? Oh, like geographically? I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I believe they're roughly the same, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm not 100% sure. I can try to look that up for next class, inshallah. No, any other questions? Yes. Can I ask another? I don't know. Um, Zainab says, maybe a silly question, but I wonder what it means that the whole country embraced Islam like it happened in Yemen. What value does it have if the people of a country embrace Islam because the ruler did so? Mm -hmm. What value does it have if the people embrace Islam because a ruler does so? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, in those societies usually uh, the peoples would follow the ruler but there is a sense of 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 agreement with the decision because as we said the najashi did not uh, proclaim his islam because he knew that people wouldn't follow so it had to do with the local culture of those different peoples uh, but when when the people all become muslim uh, we understand it. it's a genuine genuine islam they're all they're all uh, committed to their to their conversion. So it is a real conversion. Culturally, if it's done, if it's uh, you know initiated because the ruler does so, that's not a problem. You know, a person can be influenced by someone influential that they look up to, to make a decision like that, and then they're genuine in it. And if you lo look, a lot of the conversion, a lot of conversion amongst the companions were like that. So Abu Bakr was so well respected. His friends said, "Oh, what are you doing? I became Muslim. Okay, we'll do it too." They, they looked up to Abu Bakr so much. And uh, Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, we said, he told us, if you're not on board, you're not with me. And they all, but then they were the Ansar. They gave half of everything for the, so it was a genuine conversion. To the Ahlul Yemen, they are, they are very special. The Prophet praised the people of Yemen. He said, Al-Iman Yamani, wal hikma Yamaniya. He says, faith is Yemeni and wisdom is Yemeni. And uh, it's a place of tremendous barakah. So those people were genuine they were they were inclined to faith and wisdom by their nature because the the barakah of, of the Yemen. Wallahu anum. No. Did you have a question? Um, Wa alaikum salam. Um, first of all, I would like to say that this was um, like a portion of the idea and the way you explain it is not too easy and it takes time to get it out. And Perfect. Especially related to the explanation of the case of Dua. Inshallah. Uh, Barakallahu feekum. So the question uh, to uh, explain a little bit about the idea that du'a is, the, es the essence of du'a is ubudiyah and the best thing to ask for. So we were just highlighting that the Prophet Wasallam he makes du'a, he makes intense du'a for the whole night for something that he already knew would happen. Okay. So if he already knows it's going to happen, why would he plead to Allah for it? Why would he beg Allah for it? Because begging Allah, mm, begging Allah is not for the thing that Allah gives. It's for the divine presence itself. Begging Allah is for the divine presence itself. So when Allah Ta'ala says, Ud'uni astajib lakum, call on me and I shall answer you. 
the most believers look for the answer but the people closest to Allah that the Prophet ﷺ is their Imam he, they're looking for the answerer they're looking for the answerer like for those that know I'rab ud'uni astajib lakum that's a jawab talab call on me and I shall answer you so the fi'l is astajib that's what most people seek but the people of Allah seek what's hidden the, what's the fa'il the mir mustatir ana it's the hidden pronoun I, right? And this is it's it's not it's not apparent with the gift. Most of us get veiled by the gift. Oh, mashallah! I made du'a and I got this thing. But the people of Allah, they see the mustatir. They see what's hidden is the giver of the gift. Every gift indicates its giver. Every blessing indicates there is a giver. So, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he is he's ultimately seeking Allah. He's not seeking anything from Allah ever he's seeking Allah himself and he only seeks from Allah because it's pleasing to Allah like Badr for example he's not interested in Badr in and of itself he's interested in Allah but because Badr is a means that pleases Allah then he, he seeks it so the point is to express our need for Allah to express our servanthood to Allah subhanahu wa ta and this is not to negate that we ask for things but we do so insofar that it's pleasing to Allah so it's pleasing to Allah that we have afia. Allah loves to give the servant well-being. And so the Prophet taught us that He said, ask Allah for ma'afa, the, the, the comprehensive, universal well-being of an individual, psychological well-being, physical well-being, spiritual well-being, emotional well-being, intellectual well-being, communal well-being, social well-being, uh, familial well-being. I mean, every every particular of this universal is incorporated. Sallallahu al muafa fin Allah lam yati baad al yaqin khairan min al muafa o kama qal because Allah has not given anything to a servant after yaqin that's better than muafa. It's the best gift after iman and certainty in Allah subhanahu wa taala. Um, so. Um, that we don't desire, like there's, a, you know, some, like never make a dua, oh Allah, purify me from my sins. You know, like purify me from my sins or purge me. Like, we don't want that. Because if Allah did that, we would wither away. We should say, oh Allah, forgive my sins. Just erase them and give me well-being. And give me well-being. You know, Allah mangfir li dhunubi wa'afini. You know, forgive me my sins and grant me well-being. Like the Prophet in the narration, he, the, one of the Sahaba was literally, you know, undergoing so much hardship, health hardship. The Prophet visits him. He says, what happened? He says, I asked Allah to purge me, uh, purify me from my sins. And the Prophet says, why did you ask that? Ask Allah al -afia. You know, we can't handle Allah purifying us, you know, like, no, we ask Allah to forgive us, and, and that's why it's really good to just, whenever we make du'a, to add bil-lutf, ya Rabb, bil-lutf, you know, gently, <laughs> gently. Oh Allah, grant me this gently. Oh Allah, make me, if you, if you ask Allah to make you amongst the awliya, say bil-lutf, because <laughs> what the awliya go through, we can't handle. So you say, oh Allah, make me amongst the awliya, gently, bil-lutf, bil-lutf, ya Rabb. <laughs> I, can't, I can't handle the, <laughs> alhamdulillah. No, any anything else, inshallah. Yeah, I know it's Sahnan, yeah. And uh, this brother had one. Sidi, what was your question? And then we can do the. Okay, Sidi. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there were a lot of questions today, mashallah, good ones. Um, let's see here. Well, to, let me just go in the order in which they were sent, to be fair. Uh, Sister Lena asks, in relation to rifq, what are the gifts referred to in the hadith mentioned? Uh, every gift. All good. All good. Khair. All, all of khair. All of good. So, uh, uh, oh, but the, I guess the narration she's asking, because Allah gives with rifq what he does not give with other. Uh, Allahu anam. I mean, just... Uh, you know, uh, 
uh, one thing we know immediately when families have uh, gentleness and are not getting annoyed at each other is just sakina, right? Just the just the tranquility and, and peacefulness. But uh, but all all of good is through rifq and and you know there are certain things only Allah knows, but that He gives only through through rifq. That He does not give with uh, agitation and roughness. Um, and, uh, and also mending the hearts, just hearts. So you know, uh, It's by a tremendous mercy from God that you, the Prophet وسلم, that you were gentle with them. But were you difficult and coarse and hard-hearted with them, they would have dispersed from around you. So just the affinity of hearts. Through through rifq and lean, like gentleness and tenderness, there's a there's an affinity of hearts that, that otherwise won't come. Wallahu alam. Nam. Yeah. Just unmute. Okay. Um then sister Sabira asks. Well, she says, "Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi." Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi. I was wondering which area became ruled by Islam without a military battle, and how? Uh, so the Yemen we mentioned, and uh, uh, we can I can give you a, a more detailed list for next class, inshallah. I can ask another one? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Um, so then Azad asks, should the purpose of life be changing oneself or calling others to Islam? If both, then when someone is cons when is someone considered to be ready to make dawah? Uh, so the purpose of life is Allah. The purpose of life is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, at-taqarrub ila Allah, for every individual to seek to draw nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to gain his good pleasure. Uh, so that is a comprehensive thing. Part of it is also inviting, inviting others. The best invitation is when one is genuinely working on themselves. It's not about pamphlets and conferences. It's about, that guy is different. There's something about that guy, and I want to be like him. This is this is so. When a person is genuinely drawn near to Allah, then inshallah, dawah. Allah will take care of the dawah. So then, when when people ask you, you know, what's up? Why are you like this? Why? How come I never see you backbiting? How come you never speak ill about other people? How come you're so honest? How come you're so? You say, Alhamdulillah. You know, this is my religion, and I believe in the final prophet. And you, that then you can inform. What, what informs you to do those things. But uh, really, it's, it should be that people see the light. People see the light through human interaction. And if you, many, many people became Muslim through this. It wasn't... The other things are important. I'm not denying literature and conferences. I'm just saying that the, the essence, the reality of da'wah is, is just being around sanctified people. So we see, seek sanctification not for da'wah. We seek it for Allah. We seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a fruit of that if Allah opens that others can also be be drawn in, then alhamdulillah, it's, a, it's an honor to be part of that. And Allah knows best. Yeah. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. There are the last two questions I think I can combine okay, uh, with your permission. Um, Zainab asks, in seeking the poor of the community, should we make a difference between Muslim or non-Muslim, or perhaps she means in serving the poor mm -hmm. of the community? Should we make a difference between Muslim or non-Muslim? And then Lena asks as a final question, are the materially poor considered higher than the seekers of knowledge? Okay. Uh, for the first one, basically no, we don't differentiate. The fatua, one of the... Uh, another high spiritual ideal in our tradition, which is the spiritual chivalry, chivalry, is that we don't distinguish between Muslim and non-Muslim in, in the good that we bring to others. 
And so, uh, you know, obviously, in the ikhwa, the believers are family, and so there is a there is um, there, there is a priority that they have, right? There is a priority that they have. They have hukuk, they have rights that others don't. But in general, our goodwill and our service and our help is universal. Um, and and uh, there's many examples of this. Uh, you know, time does not permit. But uh, so so believers have a, a, a they do have a priority because of the rank of iman. But in general, we we seek to help both, and we don't um, discriminate or th- things like that. And then the second question, uh, Allahu alam, they're both very high. So uh, be where Allah places you. Be where Allah places you. If someone, if the doors of seeking knowledge are opened, seek that for Allah. If the doors of helping the poor are open, seek that for Allah. But uh, people of either category should see that others is higher. So the seeker of knowledge should see the, all the other seekers and the poor people is higher. And the poor person should see the seekers of knowledge is higher and just seek Allah and let others be higher. So alhamdulillah, pardon me. Uh, maybe I can ask you, answer your question after. Because it's getting late. Wasallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad an-Nabiyyul Umi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Barak.